Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number eight of our Unsolved National Park Disappearances series, where we present 10 more cases for you to ponder. In the United States National Park System alone, there are more than 84 million acres of preserved woods, deserts, mountains, and other wilderness. So it's no surprise that in the past hundred years, there have been a number of cases of reported missing persons, but what's most disturbing is these numbers are increasing at an alarming rate, and the circumstances behind these disappearances can sometimes be beyond bizarre. Today, we'll discuss 10 more unsolved National Park disappearances here in Episode 8. Please note that some of the cases have very limited information, but we will do our best to keep you updated of any new developments in future episodes. With that said, sit back, relax, and let's begin. Number 10. Jacob Reynolds 28-year-old Jacob Reynolds, along with three of his friends, Glenn Lauder, Mitch Adams, and Ryan Stone, disappeared on March 13, 1997, from the Estrella Mountain Regional Park area of Arizona. The friends were last seen riding off-road vehicles at the foot of the Estrella Mountains south of the Phoenix International Raceway in Maricopa County. The friends were reported missing to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. A suspect was later arrested in connection with the disappearance, but was released due to lack of evidence. The Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office stated they could have been victims of an animal attack after bone fragments were later found in the area. An official statement from the Maricopa County Medical Examiner, however, admitted there was not enough evidence to positively conclude whether the remains belonged to any of the missing friends. On May 6, 2001, Arizona federal wildlife officials killed a 300-pound black bear that was suspected of attacking a camper. The county attorney's office said this was likely the same animal responsible for killing these boys, and the case of the missing friends was closed. Arizona fish and game officials, however, disagreed, since there had been only one reported fatality in Arizona over the past decade from a bear attack. Plus, they believe it highly unlikely that an animal the size of the bear that was killed would be capable of attacking and killing four grown men in the same attack. The chances of that were astronomical and simply too far-fetched. What happened to these four friends, then, who were just out for some off-roading fun? Now, around the time of their disappearance in 1997, there were large numbers of reports from people all around the Phoenix area that they had seen UFOs in the sky. These sightings have led some to speculate that Jacob and the other men may have been abducted by something otherworldly. What do you think happened? The families of the four missing friends are asking for the public's help in finding out what happened to their loved ones so they can get some closure. Anyone having any information regarding their case is encouraged to contact the Arizona Division of Missing Persons on the web at www.maricopamissing.com or call toll-free at 1-855-2-FIND-THEM. As of April 2021, Jacob, Glenn, Mitch, and Ryan remain missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 9. James Pruitt 70-year-old James Pruitt went missing on February 28, 2019, from the Rocky Mountain National Park. He's described as a white male standing 5 foot 6 inches tall and weighed 150 pounds. James had blue eyes and brown slash gray hair. He was believed to have been wearing a dark blue jacket, a red-orange beanie-style hat, and blue jeans, and was also carrying a small camera bag with a Nikon Coolpix 900 camera. James left from his car in the Glacier Gorge parking lot on February 28th for a day hike to an unknown destination. U.S. Park Rangers located his vehicle on March 3 and determined that although it had been parked overnight, no permit was registered for the car. Park Rangers contacted James' family who advised him that Pruitt had no intentions of staying overnight in the park and that they had last heard from him on February 28th. The National Park Service initiated extensive search efforts. The search area covered approximately 15 square miles. There were concentrated efforts in multiple heavily forested areas, and searchers encountered chest-deep snow in numerous places. Dozens of searchers, a dog team, and multiple agencies all assisted in the search and rescue efforts. On Tuesday, March 5th, 
a multi-mission aircraft, MMA, from Colorado assisted the search and rescue with fixed-wing aerial observation, but nothing was found. Due to lack of evidence to go on, coupled with extreme winter conditions, with more than two feet of snow having fallen in recent days, the search entered limited continuous operations on March 11th. Additional searches were conducted on multiple occasions during the summer and fall of 2019, and on Wednesday, October 9, around 50 Rocky Mountain National Park search and rescue team members were involved in an area search which concentrated on off-the-trail areas in the Prospect Canyon drainage and the Glacier Gorge drainage, which are above Jewel Lake. Five separate teams conducted grid searches in areas populated with thick timber, downed trees, shrubbery, tall grasses, and many streams. Despite these numerous search efforts, no trace of James was ever found. As of this recording in April 2021, James remains missing and there have been no further updates. Number 8. Saeed Imadi 66-year-old Saeed Imadi disappeared on Wednesday, July 8, 2020 from the Crystal Basin area of the El Dorado National Forest near Strawberry Point, east of Sacramento, California. Saeed was camping with friends at the Ice House Reservoir off Highway 50. Saeed was wearing a hat, headphones, button-down shirt, shorts, and tennis shoes. He stood 6 foot 2 inches tall and weighed about 190 pounds. He was diabetic, and it's unlikely that he had his medication with him. Although he was in good physical shape with day hiking experience, he was not familiar with the heavily wooded terrain and was not an experienced climber. He and his friends went for a hike near Strawberry Point, but Saeed became separated from the group while crossing the southern fork of Silver Creek. Saeed called his friends from his cell phone at about 3.30 p.m. and told them he was on a hill near a road and that the lake was below him. His friends immediately called authorities. Saeed did not make any further calls to the group. A search was organized with a group of around 70 law enforcement officers and volunteers who searched the area with no luck, according to Sergeant Anthony Principe. For about the first 10 days that Saeed went missing, search crews were operating around the clock. Sergeant Anthony said, In that area, there's a mess of wilderness, and it's a big open area. He also said that the sheriff's office reduced the search to a limited ongoing one after so many days of searching and coming up empty. Saeed's son, Bijan Imadi, said that search crews believe they found a print of his father's shoe, which was located about a mile from where he was last seen. My dad buys everything at Costco, he said, so we contacted Costco for any shoes he had bought in the last year. We were able to send that to the search and rescue team, and they were able to determine a match to the shoe print pretty quickly. In mid-July, additional footprints were found near Granite Springs Road, more than a mile away from Strawberry Point. The family was initially hopeful the match would lead to rescue, but unfortunately, the clue led nowhere, despite search and rescue crews from 19 counties using helicopters and drones. The National Guard and California Highway Patrol helicopters joined the search, but there was still no sign of Saeed or his belongings. How did Saeed disappear so quickly and remain missing, despite such extensive search efforts? Saeed's family said they believe he's a fighter and they're hopeful the plentiful supply of water in the area has helped him survive. The family has offered a $10,000 reward for information that helps locate Saeed. As of this recording in April of 2021, Saeed remains missing and there have been no further updates. Number 7. Mark Sinclair 66-year-old Mark Sinclair disappeared on July 8, 2019, from Glacier National Park in Montana. Mark was semi-retired and was living in Whitefish, Montana at the time of his disappearance. He was briefly employed at Glacier National Park as a visitor services assistant earlier that summer. Before moving out to Montana, Mark was a prominent figure in the Vermont environmental community and had served as the director of the Vermont Conservation Law Foundation for many years. Mark also later became the vice president of the Clean Energy Group in Vermont. Paul Burns, the executive director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, said that Mark was the best kind of ally. Paul wrote in an email, he was incredibly smart and hardworking, but also generous, kind, and quick with a smile. 
He cared about people and the beautiful places he fought so hard to protect. It's heartbreaking to wake up each day now and think of him as missing. On July 8th, the day Mark went missing, he was seen by Logan Past Visitor Staff around 2.30 p.m. He was leaving the parking lot and headed toward Highline Trail. Mark left his dog in the car along with the keys, so he likely didn't plan to be away very long. When he didn't return, it was apparent that something had happened. The next day, July 9th, Mark was officially a missing person and a full-scale search and rescue operation was launched. Two visitors called the tip line after the search began and reported seeing him between Haystack Butte and Granite Park Chalet on the Highline Trail in the early evening on July 8th. No other verified sightings were received. According to park officials, the search area was characterized by steep slopes with cliff faces frequently over 100 feet high. Despite the harsh terrain, there were ground patrols, canine units, and a volunteer division that all combed the area. Two Bear Air and the U.S. Forest Service provided daytime aerial searches and nighttime infrared flights. The U.S. Geological Survey also joined the search efforts with drones. Missing person posters were placed throughout the park, but no new leads developed. The extensive search efforts continued, but over the weekend of July 13, park officials had to close the Highline Trail because a grizzly bear was charging visitors. The search went on elsewhere until the trail was reopened, but there was still no sign of Mark. Park officials reached out to the public hoping for more information or sightings, but nothing came in. On July 18, nine days after the official search began, with thousands of hours put in, park officials unfortunately had to scale back the effort. There was simply no sign of Mark and no clues to go on. The search was moved to a limited continuous mode and a park statement said that rangers would continue those efforts for the foreseeable future. As of April 2021, Mark remains missing and there have been no further updates. Number six, Tyler Stice. 20 year old Tyler Stice went missing on June 21st, 2016 after leaving his home in Kingman, Arizona. Tyler was living with his parents while attending college classes and working at a local furnishings company. Tyler had only been employed there for around a month, but he had proven to be a good employee. He was determined to keep his job because he was paying his mother rent, making his car note, and saving for later college tuition. He was attending classes locally when he disappeared, though he had plans of hopefully transferring to Flagstaff in the near future. Tyler eventually wanted to fly drones for the police department as his job. He was an ambitious kid and also quite introverted. He enjoyed gaming and other computer activities and was also an avid photographer. Tyler is described as being approximately six feet tall with brown hair and brown eyes and weighing around 130 pounds. On June 20th, Tyler skipped work, which wasn't like him. So his mom asked, what's wrong? Why aren't you going in? Tyler told his mom that he needed some time to himself. He left the house for a while, but then returned and spent the rest of the afternoon outside with his dad. When they came back in the house, Tyler retreated to his room once again. The next day, June 21st, Tyler woke up and got ready to leave the house. He packed his lunch and left around 5.30 to 6 a.m. like he would any other work day. Later that afternoon, though, Tyler's boss called his mom trying to locate him and told her he had missed two days in a row. Tyler's mom immediately knew something was very wrong, and she began calling his cell phone, but it went straight to voicemail. She called other family members to see if anybody had seen or heard from Tyler, but nobody had. When she couldn't locate her son, she called the police and tried to file a missing persons report. The police told her that, unfortunately, they couldn't do anything until after 48 hours had passed. Once Tyler could be considered an official missing person, police began investigating his disappearance. On June 25th, four days after he went missing, Tyler's black Mustang was found at the Deer Canyon Recreation Area, located in the Wallapai Mountains. Most of Tyler's belongings were not in the car, but what police did find was puzzling. In the Mustang was a laptop bag, but no laptop. His camera was found in the trunk, which was odd, because according to Tyler's older sister Jessica, he never went anywhere without his camera. There was also a cup of chai tea in the passenger side of the vehicle, but according to his family, Tyler didn't like chai tea. 
Also of note was the fact that the exterior of the car was impeccably clean, even though it was suspected to have been out there for several days. After the discovery of Tyler's car, his family was even more concerned. According to them, Tyler wasn't really an outdoorsy person, so none of the findings made any sense. Search and rescue canines were brought in, and they tracked Tyler's scent through the woods and into a nearby Girl Scout camp, about a mile away from the car, and then back out of the woods to a main road. The route was searched, but no further signs of Tyler were found. The investigation behind Tyler's disappearance deepened, and authorities began digging up any information they could on his recent history. Another shocking discovery was made. Tyler was on video surveillance June 19th, just two days before his disappearance, buying a 22 caliber rifle at a local Walmart. He then went to a second unidentified store and bought corresponding ammo for the weapon. Tyler's family was further confused by this as Tyler didn't like hunting, hiking, or anything of the like. The 22's location is unknown, but police believe it to be in his possession when he left. No further evidence was found pertaining to Tyler's case or whereabouts, and he is considered an endangered missing person. As of April 2021, Tyler remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 5. John Devine 73-year-old John Devine went missing on September 7, 1997, from Olympic National Park in Washington State. John was said to have been an experienced hiker and intended to climb Mount Baldy in Olympic National Forest using the rugged Maynard Burn Trail. When John failed to show up after the hike as planned, family reported missing to the authorities. A search and rescue operation was launched that included officials as well as volunteers. During the search, a rescue helicopter crashed, killing three people and injuring five others at the 5,000-foot level of Mount Baldy, 20 miles south of Port Angeles. It fell shortly after taking off from the mountainside to do an aerial search. On top of this tragedy, authorities said the chances of finding John alive had dropped significantly as snow and a bitter cold front swept through. The mountainous area was already steep and rugged with dense shrubbery, so the weather conditions further complicated the search efforts. Nevertheless, the search went on and included four canines. The last time John was seen was on Grey Wolf's Ridge on the park's north side. No additional sightings were reported. The search continued for a week, but no evidence was found. As of April 2021, John remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 4. Paul Michael Lamatre. 65-year-old Michael Lamatre disappeared on July 4, 2012, while competing in the Mount Marathon race in Seward, Alaska, which lies south of Anchorage. This event was Michael's first time competing in the Mount Marathon race. 2012 was the 85th running of the Mount Marathon, which has become a major event in Alaska. There are a limited number of entries, with around 90% of the participants being returnees, and a lottery system is in place to help determine who gets the coveted entries. Participants are required to run up the mountainside surrounded by thick forests and creeks. The race spans over 3.1 to 3.5 miles depending on the individual's route. Starting in downtown Seward, racers run a half mile to the bottom of Mount Marathon, then scramble about 2,900 vertical feet up muddy cliffs before getting to race point. The participants go downhill over snow and rock fields, waterfalls, and cliff facings until they reach the finish line back on the streets of Seward. Tim Liebling had warned the racers during the safety conversations prior to the race, if you have not been up that mountain before, you should consider going home right now and you should not be in this race. Michael, however, was undeterred. He was a fit and healthy person, having been a regular visitor to the gym and completed a 12K event only a month earlier. So, despite the warning, he chose to continue. The second wave of the race, which Michael was in, had started at 3.15 p.m. Around 5.45 p.m., Tom Walsh, who was a race steward, saw Michael ascending to the turnaround point about 200 feet from the top of Mount Marathon. Michael was wearing black shorts, a black t-shirt, and a black headband. By that point, the area was getting foggy and cold, but Tom saw no reason to be concerned. Tom asked Michael for his bib number, 
Michael replied, 548, as he descended back toward the town. Tom texted race officials that bib number 548 would be home in about an hour and a half. Hours later, search and rescue teams were called to the scene to search for Michael around 8 p.m. when his wife, Peggy, called and reported that Michael hadn't returned. Temperatures were falling and there was worsening rain in the area. By 2 a.m., an Alaska State Trooper's helicopter equipped with infrared radar was scanning the mountainside. Searchers were worried that if he wasn't already injured, Michael probably had hypothermia due to his clothing, likely exhaustion, and the freezing weather conditions. On July 5, the next morning, the 210th Rescue Squadron of the Alaska Air National Guard, which specialized in searching for downed aircraft and missing hikers, arrived with an HH-60 Ave Hawk helicopter to provide another infrared scan. A team of up to 60 searchers also scoured the mountain, including the other side away from the race course. There was no sign of Michael anywhere. Four days after Michael disappeared, the official search was called off, though the Seward Volunteer Fire Department kept looking. A cadaver dog was sent into the area, but found nothing, and friends had helped pay for the taking and analysis of high-resolution photographs of the mountain. These endeavors turned up empty-handed as well. It was as if Michael had just walked off the mountainside and had disappeared from the face of the earth. Mountain rescue experts, firemen, state troopers, search dogs, and Michael's family and friends spent thousands of combined hours searching the area without a single clue ever being found. Even after the official search was called off, volunteers continued to search the mountain, including Michael's daughter, Mary Ann, who said, Seward has so much meaning to my dad, so here he is looking out. He's on Mount Marathon somewhere. In July of 2013, Michael's widow sued the Seward Chamber of Commerce, who organizes the yearly race, for $5 million, but eventually settled out of court in October 2014 for $20,000. Race organizers implemented a number of new safety measures in 2013 following Michael's disappearance, including mandatory signed statements from runners that they've completed training runs on the course, a one-hour time limit for racers to reach the summit, and sweeps of the mountain by volunteers after each wave of the race concludes. These efforts will hopefully keep another tragedy like Michael's from happening. As of April 2021, Michael remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 3. Jeffrey Kirkwood 53-year-old Jeffrey Kirkwood was last seen on April 16, 2015, by a sheriff's deputy who had incidental contact with him. Jeffrey initially disappeared while on a camping trip in the Buena Vista Valley in Nevada near Fencemaker Canyon. According to his family, Jeffrey had intended to live off the land in isolated frontier-type areas and had already safely done so in other states during the months prior to visiting Buena Vista Valley. It's unclear how long he planned to live off the land. When Jeffrey was initially reported missing, search crews from Washoe and Churchill counties joined Pershing County crews to assist in the search for Jeffrey. The Nevada Civil Air Patrol flew during the searches but were unable to locate him. Some of Jeffrey's belongings were reported found in an abandoned building. One of the findings included a notebook that Jeffrey had apparently kept updated. His journal entries continued until Monday, July 27, 2015, when they abruptly stopped. There were also reports of several bloody tissues being found in conjunction with Jeffrey's other belongings. Could he have been ill and that's why he was staying away from people? Local ranchers had noticed that Jeffrey would leave his camp for a few days and then would return. There was bad weather in the area, which included heavy rainfall, and ranchers reported that Jeffrey hadn't been seen for several days. An article later stated, Jeffrey's body was found in December, but the cause of his death was unable to be determined. However, efforts to confirm the validity of the report that his body was found have waned, and no reliable news reports confirming whether Jeffrey's remains were actually located have surfaced. There have also been no public statements by law enforcement officials, and there's been no report from a coroner that his body was examined for a cause of death. Until such confirmations can be made, Jeffrey will still be considered a missing person. As of April 2021, Jeffrey officially remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number 2. Doug Pierce 
86-year-old Doug Pierce disappeared on April 21, 2005 from Mariposa County in California while on a solo camping trip. Doug was in excellent shape for his age, both physically and mentally, and it wasn't unusual for him to take trips alone. On this particular trip, he had planned to go camping near Shut Eye Peak. It is unknown what happened on the trip that caused Doug to go missing. A few days after his disappearance, Doug's 90s model Ford Ranger was found stuck in mud and partially burned on Chachilla Mountain Road near Summit Camp. Search and rescue operations were organized and conducted by the Mariposa County Sheriff's Office. The areas surrounding his truck, as well as the local campgrounds, were thoroughly searched, but no trace of Doug was to be found. Authorities stated that the vehicle appeared to have caught fire accidentally, and they theorized that Pierce became lost when he tried to walk out of the mountains after abandoning his vehicle. There is no evidence to support any theory, however, and no possibilities can be ruled out at this time. Although he had already retired from being a nuclear and chemical engineer, Doug was scheduled to do volunteer work at both Woodland Elementary and Mariposa Middle Schools the day after he disappeared. Of course, he didn't show up to either place. Doug was said to be a dedicated volunteer who was well-liked among students and often worked a 50 to 60 hour schedule. He sometimes went by the name Grandpa Doug and his disappearance was a profound loss for his community. As of April, 2021, Doug remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Number one, Joseph Lee Wood, Jr. 34-year-old Joseph Wood disappeared on July 8, 1999 from Mount Rainier National Park in Washington State. At the time of his disappearance, Joe was a writer and book editor in New York City. He worked at a nonprofit called The New Press, a publishing house in Manhattan. As an editor of the New Press, Joe was also one of the only half a dozen African-American editors in the business at that time. He was on his way to many more accomplishments, no doubt. Joe was born and raised in the Williamsbridge part of the Bronx. He had made Eagle Scout, the highest ranking attainable through the Boy Scouts of America, and he loved the outdoors. Joe also liked going to jazz clubs, eating sushi, and writing, and was even starting to write his own fiction. He was educated at Riverdale Country School and later Yale University. After Yale, Joe had started shooting a documentary about African-American students at the Ivy League institution. Jacqueline Glover, who worked with him on the documentary project, said a scene he really seemed to like was when one student who was searching to get his hair cut had to go to the black neighborhood. It was this great scene being in those two worlds. Joe had flown to Seattle, Washington on July 7th to attend Unity 99, a national conference of minority journalists. It was at the first such gathering, held in Atlanta in 1994, that Joe had met Somini Singh Gupta, a reporter for the New York Times. They ended up living together for several years. However, the two had separated some six months prior to the Unity 99 conference and had only had a brief encounter after the opening ceremonies of Unity 99. Democratic presidential hopeful Bill Bradley was also in Seattle for the Unity 99 Journalism Conference. Joe was one of eight African-American journalists to sit down for breakfast with Mr. Bradley at the Westin Seattle Hotel on July 8th, and it was said that Joe had jumped right into asking the toughest questions. This willingness to address the difficult issues head-on is what helped shape his career as an African-American cultural critic in the predominantly white precincts of New York's publishing worlds. Joe had even edited an anthology titled Malcolm X in Our Own Image, as well as written major features for Rolling Stone and Vibe magazines about actor Denzel Washington and musician Sly Stone. During his stay in Washington, Joe wanted to visit Mount Rainier National Park. Bird watching was a lifelong passion of Joe's, so he planned to do some hiking and birding at the park. After attending the conference on July 8th, he drove himself to the mountain and parked his rental car in a lot at the base. He brought a book, notepad, binoculars, and possibly a laptop, then presumably began walking up Mount Rainier's Rampart Ridge Trail. It is unlikely that he was equipped for any serious adventuring while in the park, as he only planned to be there a short time. The next day, Friday, July 9, when Joe didn't show back up for the journalism conference, his friends who were in town were concerned 
but they didn't think anything was seriously wrong and Joe had only told a casual acquaintance about his hiking plans at all. It wasn't until Sunday, July 11th, when Joe did not return to New York that so many, Joe's former partner, knew something was terribly wrong. She began calling friends and family trying to locate Joe, but nobody had heard from him. On Tuesday, July 13th, five days after Joe initially disappeared, so many filed an official missing persons report. The next day, Wednesday the 14th of July, park officials located Joe's rental car at the base of the mountain in the parking lot. Rangers immediately began searching for Joe upon this discovery. According to a receipt found, Joe had entered the park at 12.29 p.m. on Thursday, July 8th. Although he lacked more sophisticated hiking gear, a receipt found with Joe's belongings showed that he had purchased a windbreaker in Seattle. This, at least, was some good news. However, according to Joe's friends, he had a heart condition that had just been diagnosed in October of 98 after he had a fainting spell in an airport and Joe was considering getting a pacemaker because of the event. This was not such good news because it added the possibility that Joe might have had one of these fainting spells while on the mountain. Throughout the search on July 14, nothing was found to indicate where exactly Joe had gone. The Park Service organized many search teams comprised of backcountry rangers, firefighters, and general volunteers. The teams fanned out along the southwest face of the mountain and scoured the landscape. They walked the creek beds, clambered down ravines, and inspected whatever crook or crevice or cranny they came upon. Meanwhile, canine search and rescue teams covered the hiking trails, and helicopters performed aerial searches. The specific issue with this search operation was, during the winter of 98 and 99, Mount Rainier had been blanketed by the third heaviest snowfall in its recorded history. This meant that, on the warmer, sunny couple of days after Joe's disappearance, as much as two feet, or just over 60 centimeters, of snow had quickly melted, washing away any tracks or scent that Joe might have left while on the mountain. Nevertheless, the search continued, coming up empty. On Thursday, July 15th, the last known person to have interacted with Joe came forward with the first and only lead in Joe's disappearance. He was another hiker named Bruce Gaumond, who had met Joe around 4 p.m. at an elevation of about 4,800 feet or 1.5 kilometers. There was around two feet of snow on the ground, but up ahead where Joe was headed, there was snow as high as eight feet. Joe chatted with Bruce about the birds he had seen on his hike so far, and Bruce warned Joe about an unstable snow bridge a little ways up the trail, but Joe assured him that he was going to turn around soon. The strangers parted ways at that point, and Bruce continued down the mountain and left the park. On Friday, July 16th, there was a rainfall in the area that lowered temperatures, especially at significant elevations. This weather shift made the search more dangerous. Nevertheless, the search continued. On July 17th, Saturday, Joe's father, Joe Sr., his mother, Elizabeth, and his sister, Pamela, arrived at Mount Rainier. By that point, search and rescue leaders weren't hopeful that Joe would have been able to survive the 10 days since his disappearance alone in the wilderness. Phone calls had come into the park offices from the Washington State Governor, Gary Locke, as well as the White House Press Office in regards to Joe's disappearance. Park rangers decided to extend the search another day, citing improving weather conditions. Still, no evidence of Joe was found despite the extensive efforts. Sunday, July 18, an emotionally difficult meeting was held, in which rangers explained why they were scaling back the official search and rescue operation. The rangers believed that Joe had suffered from a horrible accident, or perhaps a medical emergency, and there had been no trace of him after hundreds of hours of location efforts. They unfortunately didn't believe he was alive and on the move, since hypothermia would have certainly set in without proper equipment and shelter. And they figured if he had a falling accident, searchers would have found him lying on the ground. Instead, they found absolutely nothing. There were no signs of a struggle, no equipment was found, nothing. It was as if Joe had simply vanished. Rangers pointed to the mountains, various dangers being the likely cause of Joe's disappearance. Two other men had also been lost on Mount Rainier so far that year. 
Park spokesperson named Maria Gillett said that rangers would send a helicopter and canine teams back up the mountain once the snow melted. Otherwise, the official search was concluded. Joe's family and friends were understandably devastated. Many people had even gotten together to hire a private investigator, but nothing conclusive was ever found. Everybody wanted answers, of course, but there was absolutely nothing to go on. All they could do was mourn and hope and wait for any further evidence to emerge. A final search was conducted in September of 99, and again, no trace of any evidence of Joe was found. After the final search, Joe Wood was listed as the 65th person to go missing on Mount Rainier without being found. As of April 8, 2021, Joe remains missing, and there have been no further updates. Well, friends, there you have it. Ten more unsolved National Park disappearances. Now, we'll keep you updated as new information on these cases is made available if and when it is. If you have a case you would like to see featured, please email us at nationalparkmysteriesyt at gmail.com. And also, please don't forget to like and share this video. There might be someone out there somewhere that holds the key to solving one or more of these disappearances. Finally, I'd like to remind everyone to be respectful when leaving comments below. There are still family members out there searching for answers that have come across these videos. So please treat these cases and your responses as if you were discussing someone who is close to you. Thanks again for listening, and please remember to be kind to yourselves and each other. In the meanwhile, I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.